welcome dear students to epg parshala i am dr k s nagaraja of deccan college pune teaching the course of historical linguistics to you in today's module we take up a very interesting area uh, which is called glottochronology or also known as lexico statistics in one of the previous course uh, previous modules you will have noticed that languages can be related and they are group they are grouped to group into families the question comes when the languages a b c d e f any number for that matter like what we call indo aryan dravidian there are so many families in the world when they are grouped into one family the next question is what is the internal relationship between them what was the common proto language already we have mentioned that comparing these languages we can establish a proto language however what is the distance between each other each of these is the question and uh, particularly in those languages which do not have written text this is a crucial issue uh, in fact there is no way uh, which is uh, really scientific in nature uh, verifiable in nature to be employed here unlike in uh, uh, sciences like uh, botany and others where they have certain methods like decarbon dating etc unfortunately in linguistics we do not have any such method to fill the gap as it were some scholars like morris swedish devised a method whereby given two related languages and taking the inherited words in them it is possible to measure when these two languages might have become separate from the proto language so glotta or lexo means word measuring the words remaining in the languages is lexical statistics or glotta chronology there are uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, points uh, in which uh, uh, it is useful but then there are lots of limitations as well though all these things will be uh consider uh, here glotta chronology and of course as i mentioned there is another term lexical statistics or closely related concepts though not identical indeed for some scholars these terms are interchangeable as uh, they both have to do with the application of numerical methods to to the lexicon however as the name itself implies the emphasis of glotta chronology is historical it is on the estimation of time depth which separates a pair of languages whereas lexical statistics is an outgrowth from glotta chronology and is a more neutral term it is more concerned with using the quantitative similarity in the lexicon for descriptive purposes such as the estimation of the degree of mutual intelligibility historical linguistics has a very interesting method to understand when two related languages might have become separate from a common source here the method is called glotta chronology and also there is a related term lexical statistics both these terms are closely related indeed for some scholars these terms are interchangeable as they both have to do with the application of numerical methods to the lexicon as the name itself implies the emphasis of glotta chronology is historical it is on the estimation of time depth which separates a set of languages lexical statistics is an outgrowth from glotta chronology and is a more neutral term 
it is more concerned with using the quantitative similarity in the lexicon for descriptive purposes such as the estimation of the degree of mutual intelligibility. By simple inspection of comparable word lists, for example, the fact of the relationship of closely related languages can be discovered and through the methods of comparative linguistics, it is possible to chart out the phonemic changes by which contemporary languages have developed from a common parent language and to reconstruct some of the vocabulary of the parent language. The method permits the investigator to divide to some extent the historical order of uh, dialect differentiation. That is, he can say that languages A and B diverge from each other before such and such a phonological change which is peculiar to language B took place. Or he can say that the separation of languages A and B from each other must have taken place after their separation from language C because they share phonological features which do not occur in C. The method does not however permit the investigator to say at what date the separation of languages A and B took place. So no one can say on the basis of simple inspection precisely how closely related two languages are. A method for determining the chronological relationships of cultural elements to one another by use of various kinds of linguistic evidence has been suggested by Sapir. The relative antiquity, for example, of the culture items bow, arrow and spear is attested by the fact these terms cannot be analyzed into constituent morphemes as can the morphologically transparent terms railroad or capitalist which represent recent additions to the culture. The assumption is that sound changes and shifts of meaning over a long period of time have obscured the original morphemic content of the older terms. Similarly, the archaic N of, uh, of plural of oxen attests to the ancient use of these animals since it is assumed that words using archaic morphological processes and the cultural elements to which the words refer are of ancient origin. Although these and other linguistic clues discussed by Sapir have considerable value in determining something of the relative age of cultural items and the chronological order in which they became a part of a given culture pattern, this method does not provide any exact dates. At best, this method can provide the basis for such statements as this element was probably a part of the culture pattern before such and such sound changes took place in the language or the term probably entered the culture pattern of tribe A before a period of close contact with the culture of tribe B from whose language the terminolo terminology was borrowed. Sapir also suggested in 1921 that marked similarities in the basic morphological structure of otherwise dissimilar languages indicated remote common origin of the languages since the effects of borrowing or other influence of one language or another seldom penetrate to the structural core of the language affected. The use of this principle increases the number of languages that can be postulated as belonging to a given linguistic grouping and gives insight into linguistic relationships at deep time depths but it cannot tell us when these languages began to diverge from one another. Such historical estimation is not sufficient for the needs of anthropologists, historical linguists and archaeologists who want to know at just what date linguistic changes took place and also want to know just how the language developments correlate 
with cultural changes, migrations, etc., of which there is evidence from other lines of investigation. So, lexical statistics is an attempt to provide the more precise dating that is needed. The idea traces back to American linguist Maurice Swadesh and Robert Lees, who were inspired by the method of carbon-14 dating that was invented in chemistry. The method is based on a naturally radioactive carbon isotope that decays with time with a half-life of 5,700 years. It is used in determining the date of when life ceases for any carbon containing animal or plant has revolutionized the understanding of prehistory. The challenge is to find something in language that can be shown to decay in time in some lawful way. So this method was used by them in the late 1940s to estimate the time of separation between two genetically related languages or speech forums on the basis of the number of shared native lexical items or called cognates they have. As I said, the basic assumptions of lexical statistics or even glottochronology is that some parts of the vocabulary of any language are assumed on empirical evidence to be much less subject to change than other parts. In fact, uh, the, that one which, which tends to change slowly is known as basic vocabulary. So the vocabulary normally takes words like terms for body parts, natural objects, common activities, pronouns, lower numerals, etc. Uh, they are found in mostly most of all languages uh, whereas other like uh, other words of, of, of like for instance uh, um, cuisine or, or dress or uh, even for that matter uh, technology etc they are all amenable for change much easily therefore they should be avoided. Terms for new items in the material culture, on the other hand, are frequently borrowed along with the cultural items. Such items are also easily lost with a change in the material culture or the borrowing of a new item or for other reasons. The contrast between the basic core vocabulary and general vocabulary may be seen in the following illustration of French loan words in English. As again as 50% of borrowed correspondences between English and French in the general vocabulary, we find just 6% in the basic vocabulary. Residual correspondences are found to be 27%. Thus, the archaic residuum after 5000 years turns out to be five times greater than 2000 years of accumulated borrowings. The second basic assumption of lexical statistics is that the rate of retention of basic vocabulary items is relatively constant through time. This is, given a certain number of basic words in a certain language, a certain percentage of these words will remain in the language after a thousand years of vocabulary loss, that same percentage of the residue of words will remain after a second thousand years and after a third period of thousand years, the same percentage of the words remaining at the end of the second period will remain and so on. Complete empirical evidence that the rate of loss is constant through time is still lacking, since the assumption has not yet been checked for a time span greater than 2200 years and this span does not provide adequate evidence for a constant rate of loss over a long period of time. The third basic assumption is that the rate of loss of basic vocabulary 
is approximately the same in all languages. This assumption has, has been tested in 13 languages in which there are historical records. The results range from a retention of 86.4% to 74.4% per thousand years, an average of 80.5% we get. This is not, however, conclusive evidence that all languages change at this rate, especially since 11 of the 13 languages tested are Indo-European. The fourth assumption is a corollary of the third, namely that if the percentage of true cognates within the core vocabulary is known for any pair of languages, the length of time that has elapsed since the two languages began to diverge from a single parent language can be computed provided that there are no interfering factors through migrations, conquests or other social contacts which slowed or speeded the divergence. However, there are certain problems in this method because uh, a, any language, when we look at them, even terms like color, like green, red, yellow, some have just three for, this, for that matter, whereas some have seven. Now whether the one which has seven, should we take it as basic or the one with three only? Whether the one with seven, is it because of uh, uh, diffusion or due to inheritance? Uh, this is a, a problem. Similarly, the problem areas like uh, a language may have moon, but that the word moon may not be a single word. It may be more of a phrase like eye of the night. Then how do we connect them? Because we need words which are uh, uh, clear in meaning and uh, amenable for easy comparison. A phrase will become a problem to compare it with the uh, other related language. Uh, so there are problems uh, in this kind of uh, determination. In f because of that, many scholars do not accept this method as uh, worthy of study. In spite of that, because this because there is nothing else in linguistics or historical linguistics which is comparable to that this method is uh, has been accepted thus german hund and english hound are noticeably similar in pronunciation yet in terms of meaning the german hund and actually corresponds to english dog whereas hound has become much more specialized in its semantic range, that is, in the particular category of dog to which the word refers. In fact, typically, corresponding words do not have exactly the same semantic range across a variety of languages. The problem is how closely their semantic ranges must match before two words across two languages may be considered the same. This problem is much more acute with semantic matching than with phonetic matching where the principles of phonetic change are much better understood. Furthermore, phonetic matching can be supported with whole sets of words which exhibit the same sound correspondence whereas semantic change usually applies to single words computing time depth. Putting aside for now these problems in designing the basic lexicon, Swade's idea is to assume that these words in the basic lexicon get replaced at a relatively constant rate over long time spans somewhat like carbon-14. The commonly used figure is a retention rate of 80.5% over 1000 years, that is R equals 0 0.8. Time depth is computed by the formula T equals log C by 2 log R. In this formula, T 
stands for indicating time depth in millena c stands for the percentage of cognates r stands for constant that is the percent of cognates assumed to remain after a thousand years of diverging log means logarithm of so that log c means the logarithm of the percent of probable cognates registered and 2 log r means twice the logarithm of the constant. In the basic vocabulary of 200 words which Swadesh originally proposed was gradually reduced to 100. However, in the recent times it is back to 200 word list modified somewhat depending upon the region and the same has been adopted in this study as well. The complete list has been provided at the end of this uh, particular class. An illustration is provided here taking the languages Khasi and Lingam which are which belong to Austroasiatic family into consideration. In fact a paper on it was written and published in a journal by the present author in 2004. Later in 2014 another paper based on the same paper adding two more related languages into it has been written with collaboration. But here the first one is presented as a way of illustration. In this study an attempt is made to determine the time of separation from the common or the parent speech forum of Khasi and Linga. Khasi is mainly spoken in the East Khasi Hills whereas Lingam is spoken in the West Khasi Hills. It is an accepted fact that these two speech forums are very close to each other and a comparative study of them naturally will lead to lead us to reconstruct a common ancestor. Khasi is the official language of the state of Meghalaya and is used in all the public media. Khasi Khasis are very progressive in their outlook and so they are, they are spread out. Progress has not reached however the lingam still as basic communication facilities have not developed well. In the existing schools of this area Khasi is the only medium of education and for better job prospects they have to know Khasi as well. So they often become bilinguals at an early age itself. This has influenced their speech forum to some extent. Also as they are close to Garo area they are to some extent influenced by, by Garo as well. Garo is a Tipto Burman language. Because of this their speech forum shows many diverging features from Khasi. The article quoted above is probably the first of its kind which shows the differences between Lingam and Khasi. Here Khasi is standard Khasi. In this paper an attempt has been made to estimate the possible time of the separation adopting Swadesh method of study. For this study 200 word list is taken. First a list of comparative vocabulary is provided followed by a discussion as to the determination of the number of possible cognates and non-cognates and methods involved in it. Then an attempt is made to determine the time of separation of these two speech forms from the common ancestor. World is provided at the end of the section. The most difficult part of this enterprise is in determining whether an item is a cognate or not. First of all, entries 5 and 81 and 46 and 146 have some same forms. So instead of counting them separately, only two of them will be taken for consideration. So the number of items or the words gets reduced to 198 from 200. As change is natural for all natural languages, one can observe many changes between these two speech forms as well. On the same basis, absence of change or presence of identical forms in both the languages is considered 
to be a sign of later development or a borrowing, mutual borrowing. The above word list provides various problems in determining cognates. There are basically two types of entries in the above list. Out of 198 entries, those which are clearly cognates having certain differences between them, there is basically phonetic differences between them, number 87, and two, those which are non cognates numbering 111. Within the second group, there are three subtypes. One, those which are phonetically unrelated, number 71. Those which have identical phonetic shape in both the speech forums, number 30. C, those having partial similarity in, is in 10 entries. In some of these, uh, the similarity is in the first part of the word and in some in the second part as it is difficult to decide whether these are really cognates or not they have been treated as non-cognates. These are marked with a question mark. The basic premise in considering th those entries having identical forms is that the sameness must have come about due to borrowing from one language to another at a later time. So they have been treated as non-cognates. A number has been given. In languages like these where there are no written records which could be used to verify the validity of this hypothesis, this stand at least helps in eliminating most of the later borrowings. This step obviously pushes back the separation time by many centuries. Once the number of cognates and non-cognates are identified, the rest is quite simple, that is of calculation using the set formula. For this kind of calculation, scholars have assumed a rate of retention of 80.5% for 1000 years. So the formula is the following, dividing 87 by 198 gives a ratio of cognates at 43.9 percent or 0.439 as per logarithmic table. This is the value to be taken for C in the calculation of time depth formula. So T equals log 4439 by 2 log 0.805. The logarithm of 0.439 is 0.823. So 0.823 by 0.434 gives a figure of 1.89 million. This states that these two languages became separate some 1.89 million now back. It may be noticed, noted that it is extremely difficult to provide the exact time as inclusion of even a single non-cognate in the cognate list or exclusion of even a single cognate from the cognate list, the time perspective gets changed by almost 200 years. So in order to make it more reliable, a range is provided rather than the fixed time. Also a margin is provided to take care of the possible errors. It can be, as in statistical studies, at different levels like 7 by 10 confidence level, 5 by 10 confidence level, etc. Taking the first position, in this case, a range can be provided. That is, plus or minus 200 years, that is 2.09 million to 1.69 million. So, it tells that at the, at the least latest 1500 years back, these two speech forums must have become separated from the common ancestor. The challenge of estimating the time depth of language divergence is indeed a fascinating one with profound implications for the study of human prehistory. So this pioneering work has inspired a great deal of research on language prehistory. Unfortunately, the results obtained have been uneven 
indicating that the methods of glottochronology developed so far are not totally reliable. Four main problems with this method can be listed. The challenge of designing a universal basic lexicon mentioned above is one which some investigators do do not believe is possible. Some scholars like uh, Theater believe that the closer we get to universal validity, the fewer items we have or there will be no items at all on the perfect list. Perhaps the binary distinction basic versus non-basic is too crude and culture bound to be useful. It, it may very well turn out, however, that different categories of words within a language change at different rates and that there are many such categories. This is a question that Swadesh himself considered in a later article. Such differential rates of change in the lexicon are predicted by the theory of lexical diffusion which was advanced in 1969. In any case, from the several dozen glottochronological studies which have been published up to 1992, it seems that the retention rate proposed by Swadesh of around 80% is too low. It remains to be determined whether the higher retention rate is to be solely ascribed to continued contact for certain situations or whether the estimate should be increased universally. Only many empirical studies of well-documented cases can eventually answer this question. To summarize then, this is a very interesting area. In a way, this uh, method tries to fill a gap which was felt by the linguists as against the methods available in archaeology and uh, elsewhere. However, there are limitations, in fact serious limitations. This method can be employed, but then this method can be employed only when we, when we know the languages are related, related from a genetic point of view and uh, no other relationship like typological etc. can be taken into consideration. So that is one major limitation. But then this method definitely gives some idea when the two related languages might have become separate from the ancestor. But then it, 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 there is no way of saying after becoming separate whether the languages continue to be to, to share features or not, how they diverge further, uh, these things cannot be taken uh, in this particular uh, aspect. So uh, further, application of this method is very complex because it uses logarithmic tables and a particular formula. Only when we accept them and employ them systematically, the results will be more uh, adequate and also providing uh, uh, scope for uh, uh, the whatever uh, doubts are there because uh, given a lexical item, whether it is native or borrowed can be very ticklish, particularly when languages do not have written texts. In fact, this, is, this method is useful, particularly when the written texts are not available, but also there are problems uh, when we work on such a situation. So uh, even though there are limitations, it is a very valuable method. Students should uh, study it carefully and also use their own mother tongue uh, in relation to uh, this method and see uh, how far it can be adopted. There are references available uh, and also we can get online references. There are many uh, students are advised to study them carefully. Thank you.